and technologies. Technology. 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 Through the past century, technology in oystering, dairy farming, and development have evolved the land use and industry in the Chesapeake Bay, which have changed the population demographic in the area. In its earlier days, the Chesapeake Bay was an oystering mecca. This booming industry impacted the development of the shore by making the coast a home for watermen, and towns were built around major ports. Although agriculture was not prominent, dairy farms were small family farms because of immature technology. Traditionally, uh, oyster harvest is very simple. The, the concept of it, the technology of it, was very basic. You just sort of wait it out and pick them up. Over time, as after colonization and as the um, population grew, people needed to develop a new way of pulling them out of the water once the ones that were readily available just there at the shoreline had already been harvested. So they needed to reach down further into the water column to harvest oysters. And so the technology that they'd use at that point were oyster tongs, and that's, you know, two long handles with a rake at either end to reach down into the water and to pick them up off the bottom. It's a really slow technology, which was completely fine because there was really no large-scale market for the oysters that were being harvested. So, you know, you would go out if you were an oyster tonger and you'd have your tongs, you'd have your boat, so it was relatively low overhead in terms of, you know, being able to make a little money in the industry in the wintertime. You go out and you harvest, you know, a couple bushels of oysters and then you'd need to sell them almost immediately on the docks that day because there was no method of, you know, no reliable or um, uh, appealing method, I should say, of, of preserving them. Um, they did have ways of pickling oysters, which, you know, probably tasted as disgusting as that sounds. So that never really caught on. Towns really sprang up overnight because of that oyster boom. Um, Crisfield is a perfect example. Crisfield is a town that was basically the end of the railroad line. I mean, Crisfield is a good example, like St. Michael's and other communities, where you dig down into the soil and 20 feet down you're still hitting compacted oyster shell because when they needed more land, they put their discarded oyster shells there. So it's literally the town that oysters built. It's interesting how the Delmarva formed through agriculture, you can really tell. The communities are all along the rivers, which used to be the, how we transported all of our goods, you know, off to Delmarva. You know, there used to be landings everywhere where, you know, the produce came off the land and on the landing and on the skipjacks and went into Baltimore. We didn't have this road system where you could just, you, know, you drove everything everywhere. So all your farms from, you know, the turn of the century, all the big estates and farms were on the rivers because it was their only realist, real way of transporting their goods from the farm. Uh, to the market. If you're going back 60 years, at that time, and I can remember my dad, who was an ag professor, was telling me that when he was a kid, uh, it took about 60% about of the population was engaged in farming in one way or another. Today, it's less than 2%. Back in the day when my dad was a dairy farmer, he was one of the first ones to put in a pipeline, which is before that, you had to milk a cow into a bucket milker, and then you'd have to take that milk bucket of milk and dump it into something, and then it would either pump into the bulk tank or you dumped it directly into the bulk tank. As it became harder to oyster, people turned to the land for income. Now people are using the area as a recreational destination rather than for relying on the bay for income. The development of the shore has been encroaching on the agricultural land, especially dairy farms. What you've seen happening is the government, in terms of what regulations are allowed, really sort of hobbling watermen because the fear is that they're going to harvest too much or over harvest. So, to avoid over harvest, technology has been limited and old technology or outmoded forms of technology are really being encouraged as a way to slow people down and stop them from harvesting too much. In other industries, you'd see technology sort of um, changing over time and making it more efficient, easier, and better. But in the Bay, they were really clinging to this old-fashioned method of harvest, which is, I think, one of the reasons that 
it's so idiosyncratic that people associate it so strongly with the bay. I mean, everywhere else they've got different methods of doing it and, and different ways of doing it that are more modern, but it, it's, it's like a throwback that we're really still sure. embracing here. In the 1880s and 1890s, people could bring in millions of bushels of oysters. Today, we're lucky if we were able to bring in 200,000 or so. And as that has changed, the people living in these areas have to find different ways of making a living. Here in St. Michael's, you can see around us, we have a tremendous difference and change from the waterfront community, which once existed. Perry Cabin, at one time, was predominantly agricultural. It was a farm, a horse farm. It had grains as well. Today, we have a luxury hotel and multiple private townhomes. So you can see how there's been a major shift from industry, commercial gains, to ones of public and private interest. Population is something that's changed on the eastern shore dramatically in recent years. For a long time, because it was geographically isolated from most of the rest of the country, this area hadn't developed very quickly and it was mostly agricultural or waterfront properties that people used to make a living. Now people are starting to realize how close they are to major metropolitan areas like Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore, and using this as a bedroom community to commute to these large areas or as second home. I mean, it, it's definitely been increasing populations, and I, I mean, it, that's going to con continue, continue. I mean, the last 50 years, the, uh, the, the shift over, over to, to this area has been substantial. Um, but, you know, that, uh, you know, you'll get different feelings of people uh, in the ag community, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, you, but really, I mean, you, you need growth to maintain. Now, now the next generation is really kind of, there's more of that feeling of moving back to town centers and saying, you know, um, I really don't need that much to live and I like that in town com community community approach or lifestyle. So, um, and so I think more of that's gonna happen. Unquestionably, it, it, it affects dairy. Um, and it, it's part of the reason as dairying comes um, with technology and to be able to stay up with the industry, that technology comes at a cost um, because of those costs associated um, and you know the underlying cost to operate a dairy operation, then ultimately the decision comes, what's the best use of my resources? Over the years, certainly there's been a lot of changes uh, and, and have shifted production uh, and made for a lot of rapid growth in production um, on a per cow basis. A lot of that has happened since the mid-1960s. We've seen the uh, pace of production increase, uh, mostly as a result of different technologies. Uh, we are at the, the leading edge in the technologies that we employ, um, not only from production and a management standpoint, but also from an environmental standpoint. Um, and what we're doing. We've seen a little bit of the shift in our labor force, not in 100% of the areas, but there's a lot less physical labor um, than there was at, at, you know, with, with less technology, um, but the level or the skill level of our laborers has had to increase. Um, but at the same time also, we've decreased the number of laborers that it takes to harvest the milk here on the operation. We're, we're currently milking 1,200 cows three times a day um, through a fully automated system. A lot of the technology has been actually based in the management side of things, uh, in improving um, our nutrition uh, and, and management of the cows to make big increases in production uh, per cow. Milking, it would take me longer or I'd use fewer units if I didn't have the automatic takeoffs because I'd have to keep running back and checking each cow. So uh, it has made my life easier. Uh, every cow is identified with a um, a collar um, when she enters into the milk and parlor. Every animal has a radio frequency transponder in her ear. A lot of our technology from that standpoint allows us to collect data um, electronically uh, and manage the cattle um, a lot more closely uh, and easily um, by having that, that information. Some of the other things um, pertain to the nutrition side of things. A very specific recipe is fed to the cows on a daily basis so that we can monitor the nutrition down to the uh, micronutrient um, on a daily basis. Kirtis, um, behind me is a small uh, mixer wagon. It's a stationary mixer wagon. So before that we had to do a sort of guess 
as to how much feed we were putting out there, prevents overfeeding and any kind of uh, mishaps that might happen that we couldn't see and it makes it uh, much more uh, uh, exact. The feed that we give the cow is mixed up better, it's, it's the, the amount and the quality is better. The future of the Chesapeake Bay depends on the newest technologies as well as those that have not been invented yet. Aquaculture is going to be a major part of the oystering industry, while dairy farms are in jeopardy of being turned into developed land. I think that what you'll see is that there are going to be some watermen that can that will make a transition. If aquaculture becomes the model, there are going to be some watermen, young watermen getting involved that want to make that tr transition. But I think it's a very difficult one because it means you know, a, a loss of autonomy, or at least that's how a lot of watermen see it, you know, and, and significant increase in overhead. Lose that traditional oyster harvest and become like all these other cultures, you know, it's, it's, it's a loss of something that really defines us regionally and makes us special and different. So it's it's something that, that you will be able to observe over the next 20 years. I mean, it's a change that's happening in front of us right now. Well, we expect tens of thousands, almost up to 40,000 people to come within the next decade or so. And with all of those people come a tremendous strain on the existing infrastructure and the need to build new infrastructure. Septic systems, water treatment plants, roads and impervious surfaces for parking lots and larger facilities and shopping areas. All of this comes with that added population and has had a dramatic shift and change on the bay itself the natural environment, and the living conditions of the people who currently live here. Development and how we work the land uh, had a much larger impact on, the, on the, our environment than we realized. So a lot of times as we build out towns and communities and how we, we farmed and, and used the land, we didn't take that into consideration because you didn't realize how um, big of an issue it so, so now what we're doing, a lot of what we're doing is, is kind of saying, we have to deal with both saying, okay, this is what we've done in the past that needs to be fixed, and as we move forward, how do we not get ourselves in that same situation? So that's a, a, that is a basically in a really short version of what we're dealing with with the Chesapeake Bay cleanup and its cleanup goals, is to say, we have understand that in the past we've done things wrong. So. How do we clean that up? How do we move forward and grow without doing the same issues? So technology is, is the key to both parts of that. Technology is going to help us retroactively fix the problems in the, of the past, and it's going, to, it's going to be involved in all of our future growth. In the Chesapeake Bay area, certainly in Maryland, uh, you know, there's other programs out there where there's development rights that are being sold off. There's other things to preserve agricultural land because I think uh, we're, we're, people are starting to realize the benefits of ag land. The systems out there now where the cow makes the decision to go and be milked and the actual equipment is in the barn, she goes there, the computer identifies the cow, the computer puts the machine on the cow with a robotic arm, it comes off when she's done milking and she leaves. I mean, and then, then she comes back when she's ready to be milked again. They're totally voluntary systems. I know the technologies that are going to get us partially the way there, but really new technologies that are in development are, are really going to be the, are going to be needed and are already on the way. So, so the part that gets us to the, to the end, the, the goal line, is probably going to be a technology we, we haven't even talked about. Yet. The Chesapeake Bay has seen many changes in the past. These changes will continue as new technologies are developed. We need to decide as citizens whether to have technology that either exploits or preserves our environment.